Welcome to Lecture 7.1, Basic Ring Theory. Abstract, or modern algebra, is the study of algebraic structures. The first such structure that one usually encounters is that of a group, which is a set with a binary operation and a few mild requirements. The second such structure is usually that of a ring, which is a set with two binary operations, typically addition and multiplication, and then a few other properties as well. Other structures that come up in a class on modern algebra might include fields, modules, or algebras, or possibly a few others. Now usually rings are done before fields because a field is a special case of a ring, although in this class we did fields first. And though that's a little bit unusual, I did that for several reasons. First of all, Galois theory and Galois groups. I wanted to show you as an example application of groups and group actions. And to do that, we had to see a little bit of field theory. Now, we didn't do field theory in its full generality because there are a whole bunch of, of theorems that we did not prove along the way. So if we had done Galois theory properly, as we should have, I probably would have done it after ring theory. I just wanted to give you a little taste for it. Let's start with the definition. A ring is an additive, and hence abelian, group R with an additional binary operation, multiplication, satisfying the distributive law, which ties these operations together. Of course, this says that x times y plus z equals xy plus xz, and y plus z all times x equals yx plus zx, and this holds for all x, y, and z in the ring. Now, several comments. Anytime we use addition in a group, it is understood that the group is abelian, so the plus symbol could be used for addition modulo n, plain old addition, or we could be adding matrices, or we could be adding functions. So think of a ring as a group under addition, but we're also allowed to multiply elements together. And I say multiplication, that's usually the second operation, although it, of course, could be multiplication of numbers or multiplication of matrices, but sometimes it's something a little bit different. For example, it could mean function composition. But anyways, a ring is a set with two binary operations and the distributive law. Several other remarks. There need not be multiplicative inverses. We have multiplication, but we don't necessarily have division. Also, multiplication need not be commutative. So it may happen that x times y is not equal to y times x. Let's define a few more terms. If multiplication is commutative, if xy equals yx for all elements in the ring, then we say that r is commutative. We don't use the term abelian for a ring. I don't know why. That's just... That's just standard. Next, if R has a multiplicative identity element, we usually write this as 1, or 1 sub R, which we require to be not equal to the additive identity element. By the way, if these are equal, then we just have the trivial ring with one element, so disregard that case. Then we say that R has identity, or R has unity, or R is a ring with 1. Finally, a subring of R is a subset of R that is also a ring. So it has to be both a subgroup of the additive group and it has to be closed under multiplication. Let's do some examples. First, the integers, the rationals, the reals, and the complex numbers are all commutative rings with one. Moreover, Z is a subring of Q which is a subring of R, which is a subring of C. Second, Zn, the integers modulo n, is a commutative ring with 1 as well. And you can think of Zn as a subset of Z, but it is not a subring because the binary operations are different. In Z, the operations are addition and multiplication, or in Zn, they are addition and multiplication modulo n. Third example, for any ring R with 1, the set 
mn of r we define to be the n by n matrices with entries from r. Now that is a ring, and it has identity element in, the n by n identity matrix, if and only if the original ring r has 1. Next, for any ring r, the set of functions from r to itself is a ring. If we define addition in the obvious way, f plus g of r equals f of r plus g of r, and multiplication, f times g of r to be f of r times g of r. Now several remarks. This actually holds more generally if we replace the codomain r with a different ring, s. We look at those functions. Second, it is tempting to try to define a ring where multiplication is function composition, but that's not necessarily going to work, and that's because the distributive law is going to fail. Because f of g of x plus h of x in general need not be equal to f of g of x plus f of h of x. Now later, in a few lectures, when we look at homomorphisms from a ring to itself, then this property will come for free, and in that case we can look at the ring of homomorphisms where addition is defined like this and multiplication is function composition. But we can't do that for just arbitrary functions. Example 5. The set 2z is a subring of z, but it does not have an identity element because it does not contain 1. So if you look at the set of n by n matrices over this ring, that will not have an identity element either because it does not have the identity matrix. Example 6. Let S be the set of 2 by 2 real valued matrices where only the upper left hand corner is allowed to be non-zero. That is a subring of the set of 2 by 2 matrices over R. However, note that the multiplicative identity element of R is just the 2 by 2 identity matrix, but the multiplicative identity of S is the 2 by 2 matrix with a 1 in the left hand corner and zeros elsewhere. So this example is important because it shows that you could have a subring S of a larger ring R, both rings containing identity, but those identity elements could be different. Last example, if R is a ring and X a variable, then the set R bracket X, this is all polynomials with coefficients in R, is called the polynomial ring over X. I actually have one more example for you, but it's important enough that I want to devote an entire slide to it. So recall back in group theory, we learned about the unit quaternion group. This is Q4. It has eight elements, i, j, k, and 1, and they're negatives. So here's a presentation, and here's a Cayley diagram. Recall that j and k behave like i, in that they can be thought of as a square root of negative 1, and also i times j equals k. So the operation here is multiplication. But what if I allowed addition? What if I said i plus j, or i plus i, is 2i? That would give us more elements. And that would actually turn this thing into a ring. So in other words, allowing addition makes the quaternions into a ring, h, which we sometimes call the quaternions or the Hamiltonians. This term is mostly from physics. So formally, this is a set of all a plus bi plus cj plus dk, where the coefficients are from R. Of course, you can restrict it to Z or Q if you prefer. It turns out that the Hamiltonian's H is isomorphic to a subring of 4x4 four four matrices. Now, we haven't talked about what it means for rings to be isomorphic, but I think you have a pretty good idea since we've studied groups for a while. So specifically, the Hamiltonians can be identified with these 4x4 four four matrices, where A, B, C, and D are the coefficients up here. 4x4 
formally, this means that we have an embedding or a one-to-one -one mapping from the Hamiltonians to the 4x4 four four matrices. And let's see where i, j, and k get sent. Well, i is what we get when we set a, c, and d equal to 0 and b equal to 1. So imagine that here, if we just let b be equal to 1, then i gets sent to this matrix. Similarly, j gets sent to the matrix where the a's, b's, and d's are equal to 1. So phi of j is this matrix, and phi of k is this matrix. So in other words, this ring with addition and multiplication defined, as in the quaternions, has the same structure as the ring of all of these 4x4 four four matrices, where addition and multiplication are your standard matrix addition and multiplication. The technical term of this is that H is represented by a set of matrices. So this just means that there is an embedding from our ring into a ring of matrices. Okay, so now we need to define a few types of elements in rings. First, let R be a ring with one. A unit of R is any element, X, that has a multiplicative inverse. Let U of R be the set, turns out it's a multiplicative group of units of R. Again, it's not too hard to show that U of R is a group, because if you have a unit U and a unit V, and both of these have multiplicative inverses, well then, the product has a multiplicative inverse, namely just V inverse, U inverse. That's going to be equal to 1. Next, an element x in R is a left 0 divisor if x times y equals 0 for some non-zero element y. Right 0 divisors are defined analogously. Sometimes we just drop the left or right and we say that an element is a 0 divisor if there is some non-zero element that we can multiply by it in either order to get 0. Let's do some examples. Start with the ring of integers. The units of the integers are obviously plus or minus 1. These are the only elements that have multiplicative inverses within the integers. And there are no non-zero zero divisors. Now 0 is always a zero divisor, or at least that's how we're defining it. I will warn you that some books and papers will require zero divisors to be non-zero. And it doesn't really matter which convention you take as long as you're consistent. Next, let R be the ring Z10, so the integers modulo 10. Then 7 is a unit in this ring, and the multiplicative inverse of 7 is 3, because 7 times 3 is 21, which is just 1 modulo 10. However, 2 is not a unit in here. 2 is a 0 divisor, because 2 times, two times 5 equals 10, which is equal to 0. Building off this example, let's consider the ring Zn now. A non-zero element k in Zn is a unit if the greatest common divisor of n and k is equal to 1. In other words, if n and k are relatively prime. And it's a zero divisor if the GCD is greater than 1. So back in this previous example, 7 is relatively prime to 10, so it's a unit. And 2 is not relatively prime to 10, so it's a zero divisor. Next, the ring of 2 by 2 real valued matrices has zero divisors. And here's an example of a left zero divisor and a right zero divisor. They multiply to get zero. And in this ring, the group of units are the invertible matrices. These are precisely the matrices that have multiplicative inverses. Now, a couple of these cases, actually two through four, are special examples because every element is either a unit or a zero divisor. But that need not be the case. Take the first example, 
the ring of integers. The units are negative 1 and 1, the zero divisors are just 0, and every other element is neither a unit nor a zero divisor. Here's another example that I'm devoting an entire slide to. Let's let R be a commutative ring. Usually, R is the integers, the real numbers, or the complex numbers. And let's let G be a finite multiplicative group. Then, we can define the group ring as the set of all sums of the following, sums of products of things in the ring times things in the group where multiplication is defined in the obvious way. So, well, what's obvious? Well, what's a1 g1 times a2 g2? We define that as a1 a2. The order doesn't matter because our ring is commutative. And then g1 times g2, the order here does matter because g does not have to necessarily be abelian. And then once we define the product of these two elements, it becomes easy to extend it to a product of sums of elements like this. Let's do an explicit example of this. So let's let R be the ring of integers, and let's let G be the dihedral group D4, so the rigid motions of the square. So R is a 90-degree rotation, and F is a fixed reflection. So here is a presentation. And let's consider the following two elements in the group ring. So x is r plus r squared plus or minus 3f and y is negative 5 r squared plus rf. So these are elements. So sort of, sort of like we did with the Hamiltonians earlier, we are allowing ourselves to take formal finite sums of elements in our group. The sum of these two elements, just add them up term by term, is clearly r minus 4r squared, so here we have 1r squared and minus 5r squared, minus 3f plus rf. And their product, well you just write it out like this and multiply as if you were multiplying polynomials. So this is just r times the second term plus r squared times the second term plus or minus 3f times the second term as well. So if we multiply this out, then we get these six terms. Now notice that some of these we can simplify. r to the fourth is just equal to the identity element. So this whole term is equal to negative 5. We usually like to write f r squared, or at least I do anyways, as r squared f, and then f r f is actually equal to r cubed. So we can simplify terms. So how many r squared f's do we have? We have 1 plus 15 of them. Let's see what else we can simplify. Here we have negative 5 r cubed minus 3 r cubed. So that gives us the following. Negative 5 minus 8 r cubed plus 16 r squared f plus r cubed f. Several remarks. First of all, the Hamiltonians that we saw earlier, this is not the same ring as the group ring RQ4. The elements look similar, but they are different, and let's try to understand why. So the Hamiltonians, H, this is the set of all A plus BI plus CJ plus DK, where A B, C, and D are all real. And then RQ4, the group ring, is the set of all A times, I'll write, I'll write the one, A times one, I don't have to, plus B, I, plus C, J, plus D, K. But now we also have four more group elements. So we have E, times negative 1 plus f times negative i plus g times negative j plus h times negative k. And fortunately, I've run out of group elements. Otherwise, I would be in trouble. And now, of course, a all the way up to h. These are all 
real numbers. So every ex expression like this leads to an element a Hamiltonian, but there are more things in here. And to see why, let's suppose, let's consider the element where a and e are equal to 1 and everything else is 0. So again, every choice of coefficient leads to a unique element in the group ring. So if we do this, then we get 1 plus 1 times negative 1. So we get 1 plus negative 1. And this element is not 0, because the only 0 element in this group ring, by definition, is when all of these elements are 0. So this thing here is not 0 in R Q4, but as an element in the Hamiltonians, of course, it is equal to zero. So these rings are different. The next remark, if the order of G is greater than one, then the group ring RG always has zero divisors. To see why, well, take an element, little g, that's not the identity, so say it has order K, then notice that the product of one minus G times the sum of powers of g here, 1 plus g all the way up to g k minus 1, is just equal to 1 minus g to the k. This sum telescopes. We only get 1 times 1 and negative g times g to the k minus 1. Everything else cancels. And of course, if g has order k, then this is just 1 minus 1, which is 0. So 1 minus g is a left 0 divisor, and this is a right 0 divisor. And that's another reason why the Hamiltonians is not the same as the ring RQ4. RQ4 has 0 divisors because Q4 is non-trivial. However, the Hamiltonians do not have 0 divisors, other than 0, of course. Finally, I claim that RG contains a subring isomorphic to R. So let's see why that is. So RG is the set of all, I call them linear combinations, so things like R0 times, say, the identity, plus R1 times G1 plus R2 times G2, where this sum is taken over all of the elements in the group. And well, if you just look at the ones of this form, in other words, look at all the elements where R1 is 0 and R2 is 0 and all of the other coefficients are 0, then we have a subring of elements in R times the identity, which is isomorphic to R. Next, sitting inside the group of units of the group ring, RG, is a subgroup isomorphic to G. Because every element of G has an inverse, the multiplicative inverse, and every element of G is contained in the group ring, RG, and therefore we know that the units have to, have to contain at least everything in G and likely more. Now that we've seen a lot of examples of rings and we've learned about units and zero divisors, I want to classify different types of rings. So here's a definition. If all non-zero elements of a ring R have a multiplicative inverse, then we say R is a division ring. In other words, we are allowed to divide by elements. So when you hear division ring, I want you to think it's like a field, but we don't necessarily have commutivity. So multiplication AB might not be equal to BA. Next, an integral domain is a commutative ring with one and with no non-zero zero divisors. So when you hear this, you should think it's like a field without inverses. An integral comes from the word integer, as in the integer z. So integral domains have a lot of properties that the integers do. And namely, they don't have zero divisors. So fields are these algebraic structures that where everything you want to be true is true. You can divide, you can multiply, you don't have zero divisors. And these concepts are what happens if you lose a particular property from a field. 
So again, a division ring is like a field, but you don't necessarily have commutivity. And an integral domain is a field, but you don't necessarily have multiplicative inverses. In other words, a field is just a commutative division ring. Moreover, we have the following containments. All fields are division rings, but not all division rings are fields. All fields are integral domains, and all integral domains are rings, but these containments are proper. For example, rings that are not integral domains include Zn for composite n, 2z, so the set of all even integers, it does not contain 1, mn of r, so that n by n matrices over r, z cross z. That is not an integral domain because if you define multiplication component-wise, 1, 0 times 0, 1 is 0, 0. So there are 0 divisors in z cross z. And the Hamiltonians are not integral domains because they're not commutative. i times j is not equal to j times i. Examples of integral domains that are not fields or even division rings include the integers. You can't divide in the integers. Polynomials over the integers, same issue. You can't, you don't have multiplicative inverses. Same thing if you have real valued polynomials or if you have real valued formal power series. That's what I mean by this double bracket. These are integral domains, but they are not fields. Finally, an example of a division ring that is not a field that we have seen are the Hamiltonians. And everything that we want to be true in a field is, we have multiplicative inverses, except multiplication does not commute. Rings, even more so than groups, can be thought of as abstractions of familiar algebraic structures, like the integers, real numbers, and complex numbers. So when we do basic algebra growing up, we often take for granted basic properties such as cancellation. So if, if you write down that ax equals ay, you right away conclude that x equals y. However, this need not hold in all rings. Here's some examples where cancellation fails. If you're in Z6, then 2 is equal to 2 times 1, and it's also equal to 2 times 4. But you cannot conclude that 1 is equal to 4. Here's another example using the ring of 2 by 2 matrices over R. So the matrix 1, 0, 0, 0 is equal to 0, 1, 0, 0 times 4, 1, 1, 0 but it's also equal to that same matrix times 1, 2, 1, 0. But obviously these two matrices are not equal, so we can't just cancel on the left. Fortunately, everything works out fine with cancellation, as long as there aren't any non-zero zero divisors. And that's what the problem was up here. In both of these cases, we had a number 2. 2 is a zero divisor as is this matrix, 0, 1, 0, 0. We can formally state and prove this. So I claim that if R is an integral domain and A is non-zero, then anytime AX equals AY, we can conclude that X equals Y. And the proof is very short. Let's suppose that AX equals AY for a non-zero A. So we can write 0 as ax minus ay, or just a times x minus y. However, since a is non-zero and r has no non-zero zero divisors, then this x minus y has to be equal to 0, which implies that x equals y as desired. Let's conclude with a quick discussion about finite integral domains. So here's a lemma, which I put on the homework for proof, although it's, it's very simple. It doesn't take more than a line or two. It says that if R is an integral domain and A is a non-zero element of R, then every power of A is non-zero. Let's think about why that is. So if A to the K, let's suppose, suppose K were the smallest power of A 
that yielded zero, well then a to the k is equal to a times a to the k minus one. And if that is zero, then a is a zero divisor, because here's a times something non-zero being zero. And that can't happen in an integral domain. Okay, so write that up formally on the homework. And that's very useful in the following theorem, which says that every finite integral domain is a field. So we've seen infinite integral domains that are not fields, for example, the integers. But I claim that if R is finite and an integral domain, then we get multiplicative inverses for free. So let's prove this. Let's suppose R is a finite integral domain and A is a non-zero element. All we have to do is show that A has a multiplicative inverse. So let's consider the infinite sequence of powers of A, so A, A squared, A cubed, and so forth, which must repeat. Oh, I didn't say it, but assume A is not the multiplicative identity. Otherwise, it's trivial to show that A has an inverse. So consider the following sequence. Then let's pick any i and j with i greater than j for which a to the i equals a to the j. And we know that has to happen because this sequence repeats. In that case, then a to the i minus a to the j is clearly equal to zero, but we can factor this as a to the j times a to the i minus j, this is a positive power of a, minus one. Since R is an integral domain, no zero divisors, and A to the J is non-zero, that's by this lemma up here, then this thing has to be zero. In other words, A to the I minus J, this is a positive power of A, equals one. So because this is a positive power of A, we can write it as A times A to the I minus J minus one. Since a times a to the i minus j minus 1 is equal to 1. This element, this positive power of a, is the multiplicative inverse of a, which confirms that r is indeed a field.